Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt, on the foal of a donkey. And he shall speak peace to the nations. He shall rule from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. Let's begin our service this morning by singing number 500, a hymn that reminds us, The Lord is King. Lift up your voice, O earth, and all you heavens rejoice. Number 500. Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. We bow before you, our Lord and our King, the ruler of earth and heaven, the one whose kingdom is everlasting, without end. And what comfort it is to us in a world that seems so unstable, so fearful, so mysterious, so out of our control. What a comfort it is, Lord, to know that in your hands and your hands alone, all ultimate issues belong. And that we, frail children of dust as we are, that we can look to you, a good and a gracious creator who knows us, who knows our feeble frame, yet who cares for us and who loves us. Forgive us, Lord, that so often we do resist your will. So often we do distrust your care. Constantly we do quarrel with your wise and perfect decrees, your commands for our lives. So often we think that we are better gods than you, the true God and Lord. Forgive us, for the foolishness that makes us think that we can rule our hearts, our lives, our world better than you, you who made us, you who knows us and so loves us. How foolish we are, O oh God, and how greatly in need of your forgiveness. 
So turn our eyes, we pray, afresh to you this day. Open our ears so that we be not deaf to your word. Open our eyes to see again wonderful things out of your law of life given to us openly and wonderfully. And open our hearts, we pray, to receive your touch and not to resist your call upon our lives. Lead us, we pray, in the way everlasting that we may know your peace both now and forever and not the ruin that can be the only end of our hopeless self-rule and of resistance to your wonderful grace. So hear us, Lord, we pray. Draw near to us as we draw near to you humbly in faith and trust. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our great Savior. Amen. <clears throat> well, a very warm welcome indeed to all of you uh, with us this morning, whether you're up here and I can see you, or whether you're downstairs, you're warmly welcome indeed. You'll see, not if you're here, but if you are in one of the downstairs rooms, that the table is spread, and at uh, the close of our service this morning, we gather around the Lord's table. I'll lead that from uh, downstairs, but we'll all take part, and all who love the Lord Jesus Christ and who belong to him are welcome to join us uh, at his table. Let me uh, bring to your attention one or two notices from these sheets that uh, I hope you've received on the way in. Uh, there are uh, also some cards in there, these cards that uh, have um, details on the back that you can fill in if you're new here or if you're uh, just been coming a short time. If you want to find out more about what goes on in the life of the church and things that are for you that you can be involved in, please fill in one of these, put them in the offering baskets or uh, leave them at the doors and uh, we'll make sure that we uh, get back to you with information. In the leaflets here, there is uh, prayer news for this month, particularly from our UCCF staff workers, just as uh, student terms are all beginning. Uh, let's be praying for them very particularly. There are details there for us to use over the coming month in particular. So don't lose those. And inside you'll see there are a number of things relating to the coming week. I'll leave you to read those at your leisure, but do take note of them. On the right-hand side, let me draw to your attention uh, 150 years of the work of OMF, which is being celebrated this year. And uh, on Saturday the 26th, there's a half-day conference here by OMF in our church building, uh, including Scott Murray speaking, those of us who were there on Wednesday uh, we're so thrilled to hear of Scott's work at the River Kwai Christian Hospital. Do come along and support him and others and uh, hear more about the wonderful work of mission in uh, Southeast Asia. Do put that date in your diaries. There are other things there for you to note, but let me mention two things that are not here. First, there are leaflets uh, entitled Assisted Suicide. There are a lot of these leaflets at all of the doors and hopefully in the foyer as well. Some of you will know, I hope most of you know, that this coming week there will be uh, a reading of a bill in Parliament seeking to uh, legalize assisted suicide. Now that is a very uh, important bill, and it's very, very important that that bill should be defeated. Um, these leaflets give you a lot of information. They tell you what you can do. And uh, the main thing they want to encourage you to do is to get in touch with your member of Parliament this week and urge them to vote against uh, this bill. The most effective thing that we can do as citizens is contact our MPs. They take notice of every single piece of correspondence, every email, every letter, and uh, there's information here that will help you do that. Let me encourage you to take these, use them with our, uh, in our prayers in the coming weeks, uh, and also to act upon them. So please, uh, let's take that very seriously. And finally, just to say that um, I know that many of us will be watching with uh, real horror the scenes on our TV screens uh, showing this flood of refugees coming from, well, particularly from Syria and North Africa, uh, which seems to be just so engulfing Europe uh, at the moment. Many of us will be wanting to uh, do something to help, but perhaps wondering just what exactly we can do. Let me encourage you that if you want to give uh, money towards helping those refugees, that we do so uh, through the auspices of the Barnabas Fund. The Barnabas Fund is... Uh, a charitable organization, a Christian organization that we're very heavily supportive of in this fellowship. Um, they have a campaign at the moment uh, raising money particularly to help uh, rescue Christian people 
from the land of Syria. Um, Christians in Syria have been persecuted perhaps more than any other minority, and if we, brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world, are not helping them, who else can we look to uh, to help them? And the Barnabas Fund have got uh, people working on the ground. They've got people helping uh, people to escape from Syria, not by dangerous boats across the sea, risking drowning, uh, but across the border in carefully managed ways into Turkey uh, and elsewhere. And uh, our elders were discussing this yesterday morning and praying about this, and we feel that that is the most effective and helpful way and the very best way that we as a congregation can help. We hope that next Sunday we'll be able to get some leaflets uh, on the chairs telling you exactly how to do that. But if you want to do something before then, you can go online and look up Barnabas Fund, and it'll be very, very clear how you can help uh, through donating via them. So we encourage you warmly uh, that if you want to help, that's uh, a very, very helpful uh, and effective way of doing so. Well, I'm going to leave you to read the rest of these notices at your leisure. Please do that. Don't just uh, chuck them away and ignore them. Uh, It's here for a reason, and uh, we want you to know the information there. But uh, we're going to turn now to our Bible reading this morning, and we're restarting our studies in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. You'll find that on page 878 in our Bibles. And let me just make some introductory remarks as we return uh, to our study. We're embarking now on the last movement of Luke's gospel, the last part of the second half of the gospel, which, as you'll remember, has been so dominated by the journey of Jesus with his disciples through Jerusalem uh, to glory. Remember, right back at the very beginning of Luke's gospel, in chapter 1, Luke tells us he's written a carefully ordered account And uh, we've seen that very clearly, haven't we, as we've gone through uh, his gospel. Before the summer, we were looking at chapters 13 to 17. Jesus is laying out there the perfection of his glory uh, that is to come. And then to halfway through chapter 19, uh, Jesus is teaching how to be prepared as his followers for that coming glory. But now we come to the end of the gospel and to the climax of Jesus' journey. And we're going to see exactly how Jesus enters His glory, that is, through His coming passion, through the cross. Remember back to chapter 9, verse 51, that was the halfway point, the turning point, when Jesus set His eye uh, to go to Jerusalem because the time was near for Him to be taken up, that is, taken up to glory. And because Jesus is the King who has come to reign on David's throne, then He must go to Jerusalem, the capital of David's kingdom, because He's the Savior come to save his people from their sins. He must come to his temple, the place of sacrifice, the very heart of uh, the devotional life of his people. And so we'll see that as we come to this last section of Luke's gospel, all the focus uh, is on Jerusalem and on the temple. If you look just at chapter 19, verses 28 and 29, you'll see there that Jesus moves from Bethany to Jerusalem. And uh, if you look to the very, very end of Luke's gospel, at the very end of chapter 24, you'll see that what we find is Jesus leading his people uh, from Jerusalem back out to Bethany, from where he ascends uh, into the glory of heaven and from where he tells his people to remain in Jerusalem uh, until power from on high uh, comes to them so that they will receive the spirit of the risen Jesus and begin their mission uh, to the whole world, beginning at Jerusalem. So all of this is focused on Jerusalem and on the temple and on the coming of the Lord to his temple and the coming of the king uh, to his city. But Jesus will enter his glory only through his passion, only through being rejected as the king when he comes to his own people. And that's the story that we begin to read off here in Luke 19. So let's read Luke 19, uh, verse 27, through to the end of the chapter. When Jesus had said these things, he went on ahead and going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on, encountering, on, on entering you'll find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. 
And if anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and, notice, found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners did indeed say to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. They will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. Amen. May God bless to us this his word. Well, as our musicians play now quietly, our offerings for the Lord's work will be received. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, our hearts are full of the uh, thoughts about this world and the tragedies that we see unfolding before us on our TV screens and in our news media. 
We think of the terrible human misery that is on view as so many desperate to find refuge and succor from these war-torn countries are risking life and limb, crossing the seas with many dying, even little ones. We pray, Heavenly Father, for an end to be brought to these hazardous voyages that are perpetuated by evil and wicked, exploitative people seeking to make money out of smuggling human beings, taking thousands and thousands of dollars from those who have no hope and caring nothing if their boat sinks or survives. We pray, Lord, for governments, for nations, for armed forces, for all those who are involved in seeking to bring an end to these dreadful journeys. We pray also for the need to bring an end to the reason for these dreadful journeys, and very especially the raging civil war in Syria and the continuing breakdown of law and order in lands like Libya and other parts of North Africa. We pray, Lord, for the leaders of Europe and of the United Nations. We pray for wisdom, and we pray for a will to do that which is right, even though it be costly. We pray, Lord, for the situation in Syria in particular and for the way that superpowers in the background seem to be prolonging and worsening that conflict. We ask, Heavenly Father, for mercy and for peace. We pray for the rolling back and the destruction of the terrible, wicked forces of ISIS and the darkness that they are spreading over Iraq and Syria at this time. We pray very particularly and especially for brothers and sisters in Christ in these lands who have suffered so greatly for so long and so often seem to be at the bottom of the pile in terms of being helped and aided in surrounding countries. We ask, Lord, for those who are engaged in helping them and bringing relief in terms of funds, in terms of protection and shelter and travel. And we do ask for those working with the Barnabas Fund that you would give them the resources that they need and give them the help and the ability to do what they can to save life and to bring succor to those who are in such dire straits. We pray, Lord, for our own nation, that we as a people would view these things rightly, not naively, but not selfishly. And that as a land and a people so greatly blessed, you would help us to know how to do what is right, to share our wealth and our land with others, and yet also at the same time recognizing that our governments and our leaders do have the responsibility to protect the population and a right to see the many dangers that face us in such a situation as this. Lord, we have not the wisdom to know how to ask or what to ask for, but we pray that you, our Heavenly Father, who is all-powerful, and is merciful, would hear our prayers and answer us better than we ourselves could know. As we think of our own nation, O oh God, we bring to you our leaders and our government and also the opposition. In this week when the new leader of the Labour Party will be announced, we pray, Lord, for our parliament, for everyone who is an elected representative and everyone who serves in the upper house also, that you would give us leaders of integrity, of wisdom, those who seek what is good and right, those who seek to serve the people as a whole, not to serve themselves and to be driven by ulterior motives. Lord, it's easy for us to be cynical, and so often we are about our politicians, and yet 
when we look at other parts of the world, how much we have to be thankful for. We pray for this bill to go before the House seeking to legalize the taking of human life at will, making us mere creatures of dust into gods who decide life and death. Guard us, Lord, and rescue us, we pray, from such willful rebellion in the heart of man, for such legislation that would bring undoubtedly exploitation of the weak and could lead us into all kinds of unimaginable and desperate horrors. Give wisdom, we pray, and give courage to our representatives to stand up for the weak, for the vulnerable, for those who cannot fight for themselves, for those who cannot speak for themselves. Keep us, we pray, O God, from sinning against you and your word as a nation in so public and so serious a way. As we think, Lord, of our nation this week, we give thanks for our Queen Elizabeth. And as on Wednesday, her reign will become the longest reign of any monarch of this nation. We give you thanks for her dignity, for her selfless duty, for the way in which she has reigned so wonderfully well over us for all of these years. Above all, O oh God, we thank you for her clear and consistent Christian faith, shown in both word and in deed, and unashamedly proclaimed not only to our nation, but to the whole of her commonwealth, every year without fail in her Christmas broadcast. We thank you for her. We thank you for her influence. We pray earnestly, long may she reign. And we ask, O oh God, that her Christian faith, her clear understanding of righteousness, will be transmitted not only to her family, but also to the whole of the royal household, and through her also continue to have its effect upon our government and our society as a whole. And so, God, we pray for our queen, for our nation, for our people. How greatly we need your word. How greatly we need the mercy and the love of the King of Kings. How much, O oh God, we need to welcome you as ruler over our land and over our lives. And so we ask humbly this morning, begin in our own hearts here as we come before you. Humble us, we pray, to hear your words, to bear your rule, to gladly receive our King and to know his wonderful peace. So hear us and open our eyes and our hearts, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in prayer then, our version of the Lord's Prayer, as we sing, Our Father God, who dwells in heaven, draw near and hear your children.
Well, do turn with me, please, to uh, Luke chapter 19, page 878, if you have one of the church uh, visitors' Bibles. Now, the great paradox that we've seen all through Luke's story is that Jesus announces his kingship. He tells of his coming uh, kingdom of power and glory, the day when the Son of Man will be revealed to the world. Uh, You remember he talks about that at the end of uh, chapter 17. And yet at the same time, he tells people that already his kingdom is there. It's in the midst of them, in his presence. And that for now, it's not going to be seen with uh, great signs that can be observed by all. But no, it requires the perception of real faith. And it's for those who will receive his words, not reject his words. And uh, in chapter 18, he goes on and and talks very plainly to the twelve and tells them that before his kingdom comes in power and glory to be seen by all, he must first be rejected and killed. And only after that will he himself enter the glory of his own kingdom. And so Jesus has a focus on teaching these two very distinct aspects of the coming of his saving glory into the world. On the one hand, there will be a coming with power which will be visible to all one day and which he is announcing in his ministry very clearly beforehand. There is the coming of the Lion of Judah as promised by the prophets. There is the coming of the sovereign come to earth to announce his glorious reign. But on the other hand, there is also a coming in apparent weakness unseen except by the eye of faith, via a hidden stable, via the cruel cross, and yet, nevertheless, to establish in the new covenant in his blood a kingdom of peace for lost sinners that Jesus has come to save. There is, as well as the coming of the Lion of Judah, the coming of the Lamb of God, the coming of the Savior to achieve his gracious redemption. And uh, as David Gooding, I think, very helpfully points out in his book on Luke's gospel, this dual focus seems to determine the way that Luke uh, structures the last section of his gospel because in it he very clearly portrays two distinct comings of Jesus to Jerusalem. And each one begins and ends the same way. I wonder if you'll just look with me. Chapter 19, verse 28 to the end of chapter 21 is the first one. And it begins, as we read, with Jesus sending two disciples on and ahead of him to find a colt to borrow for his use. And in verse 32, as we read, they found it just as Jesus had told them. And then that section ends at the end of chapter 21 with Jesus coming and being in the temple, and there's a sort of summary statement about Jesus teaching in the temple. But then if you look at the beginning of chapter 22, right through to the end of the gospel, we'll find that again Jesus enters Jerusalem. He sends two disciples ahead of him, this time to borrow a room in which to have the Passover. And what do the disciples find? Chapter 22, verse 13, they find it just as Jesus had told them. And the gospel, of course, ends with all the disciples waiting in the temple uh, with joy upon the Lord. You see, it's very deliberate and obvious, isn't it? Beginning and ending the same way, using the same language. We're meant to notice that. It's Luke's big, bold heading, if you like, if he had a big bold heading and a typewriter uh, to write it with. And in that first movement, Jesus enters the city and publicly is proclaimed as king. But he is rejected and refused uh, by his people. In the second movement, he enters the city privately and quietly and he speaks to his disciples in the upper room about his coming death and resurrection and vindication and about how he will enter glory, just as he has been telling them all the way along. And remember at the end, the angels say that to the women at the tomb. Don't you remember? He's been telling you this. It happens just as he said. So what Luke is telling us is that the crown of glory is certain for Jesus the King, and indeed for his people. But it comes only through the cross for the Lord Jesus. And the promise of his gospel For those who are his, that they will share that glorious reign is certain. But that also will come only through 
the gracious redemption of Jesus, only through rescuing his people from the plight of their sin. That must happen if they're to share his glory. So to inherit the glory of Christ's coming kingdom, you must perceive and you must receive the grace of the Savior, the grace of the servant king who comes to bring cleansing from sin. You must rejoice in the coming of the Savior who offers his peace, not reject him. And that's what the, the prophets had long promised. I read at the beginning of the service from the prophet Zechariah, chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He shall speak peace to the nations. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free. On that day, the Lord will save them. On that day, there shall be a fountain open from the house of David, for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. That's the gospel of God that he's promised to his people. The king coming, offering peace through cleansing and forgiveness. But here's the thing you see. We human beings, we love the idea of achieving the heights of glory, but we're none too keen on being humbled by grace in order to do so. We love the idea of reigning over the world, but we hate the idea of having to humble ourselves to be ruled over by someone else, by one who claims sovereign control over our lives. One who dares to say that, that actually our lives are dirty, and that we need cleansing. Who dares to say that we're ignorant and we need instruction. Or that we're lost and that we need to be found. Or that we're living in rebellion and we need to repent. Something in us very deep down really does not like to hear those things. And that's why the message of Jesus Christ has always been met not with great rejoicing, but with grim rejection by so many people. And friends, so little has changed between first century Jerusalem and 21st century Glasgow. And that's why we need Luke's message here in our passage today, a message of warning not to reject the king who comes in peace. So I want us to look at this passage in a little bit of detail. <clears throat> And you'll see, if you look at verses 28 to 40, how Jesus coming into people's lives to announce his reign is so often met with rebuke instead of praise. We see a people blind and deaf to the proclamation of his coming. Now these verses show us the very public nature of the self-revelation of Jesus Christ to his people Israel as both their king and as the promised savior of the whole world. <clears throat> The king come at last to bring in his messianic kingdom. And it's very public. And that is something that is so characteristic of the true God. Let me say this. The true God reveals himself publicly to all. He doesn't hide himself in hidden mysteries that are uh, things that can only be fathomed by an elite few. Beware of anyone who claims special knowledge of God, who, who wants to initiate you into something that's not open to all people. Be very, be very wary of that, especially if they want you to give them something in order that they do it, or charge you for it, or get something out of you. No, when, when the God of heaven makes himself known, he does it openly and publicly. His revelation is accessible to everybody. That's what Paul says later on to King Agrippa, do you remember? This thing was not done in a corner, O king. The true God reveals himself to this world publicly. And therefore, man is responsible to respond to what God makes known of himself, obviously. And here Jesus reveals himself unmistakably to a people who should understand every single detail of what is going on here because they are Israelites. They're people prepared through centuries of having the scriptures, the prophetic words and writings. And this message that Jesus gives them here is both uh, both clearly pictured, it's acted out, 
And it's also announced in clear proclamation. And it is unmistakably saying, Behold, your king at last is coming to you. See, in verses 28 to 36, you'll see first, Jesus is pictured clearly as the coming king. It's a vivid fulfillment of that prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9. Now, Luke doesn't quote the words from Zechariah as Matthew does in his version in Matthew 21, but he doesn't need to because it's so blindingly obvious to these Israelites. Jesus knows exactly what he is doing here. Look how deliberate it is. Verse 30, he sends two disciples ahead. He tells them exactly what to expect and what they'll find and what to do and say when somebody asks what they're doing. And then verse 32, they find it just as he told them. See, his regal authority and his control is underlined. And it's repeated for us in verses 33 to 34. No need for just telling us what happened, but Luke tells us again just to emphasize. God's purpose is unfolding exactly according to plan under the authority of Christ the King. Just as it was told them. Remember, that's exactly what the shepherds find in chapter 2 when they went to the stable, didn't they? They find it just as the angels had told them. And then, you see, Jesus is set in honor on their cloaks, on the colt, and they lead him in procession into Jerusalem, just exactly as King David had done with his son Solomon in First Kings chapter 1 when he led him in procession into Jerusalem and anointed him as king after him. And all the people said, may his throne be even greater than David's throne. And you see, these people who are watching Jesus here, they're people who knew these scriptures by heart from their earliest days. They'd been longing all their lives for Zechariah's words to come true in the coming of the king. They just could not possibly miss the statement that Jesus is making here. But just in case the picture wasn't enough, look at verses 37 and 38. He adds clear proclamation that leaves them in absolutely no doubt whatsoever. And they're echoing here, the disciples, another well-known scripture from Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you notice that they even add in the word king here instead of he, just to make it even more explicit. This is the king who comes in the name of the Lord that Zechariah was speaking about. It's absolutely plain that that's being fulfilled before their eyes. Behold, your king comes to you. On a colt, the foal of a donkey, and he shall speak peace to the nations. And the disciples clearly got it. Look at verse 39. That's what they're saying. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest, singing just like the angels sang to the shepherds, you remember. Here is God's king bringing peace from heaven to earth. And all through Luke's gospel, we've seen Jesus Declaring that personally to people, hasn't he? Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. That's what he said to the woman in chapter 7. That's what he said in chapter 8 to the woman with the issue of blood. Go in peace. And now here he comes offering peace to all. A public proclamation from the king of heaven of peace, even for the sinful people of this world, even for people with whom God has been at war because of their rebellion and their rejection of him. Peace in heaven at last. That's the message. Well, given the context here in Israel, you would expect, wouldn't you, an abundant outburst of joyful praise led by the, the leaders of the people, led by the, the religious leaders, the people who are charged with teaching the scriptures and, and charged with the, the spiritual health of the nation. But look at verse 39. What do we see? His revelation of God's mercy and his offer of peace is met not with praise, but with rebuke and total resistance, led by the spiritual leaders of the day. And Jesus answers them in verse 40 and says, in effect, look, even the very stones on this road are more spiritually attuned than you are. The whole creation, even, even inanimate objects, shout for joy at the coming of the world's king. And yet you, you reject. So perverse and so twisted are their hearts. 
that their eyes are blind to what God has placarded in front of them and their ears are deaf to what he is shouting to them at the top of his voice. It's astonishing, isn't it? Here is the most privileged nation on earth. Here is the most privileged generation of that nation in history. And yet they will not see and will not hear the king coming to them, offering peace. There's no praise, just resistance and open rebuke to those who do perceive and want to receive him. But sadly, that is the history of Israel. From beginning to end, as you read the Old Testament and as you read the New Testament story unfolding. But it's not just the history of Israel, is it? It's the history of man. How foolish the talk is in our modern world about God. We get clever boffins on radio shows having discussions about whether there's any evidence that might suggest God's existence. How utterly absurd that is. God has not hidden himself from man. It's man who has hidden himself from God and from the God who placards his presence before man all the time and shouts at him, I'm here. It's man who has shut his eyes and closed his ears and closed his heart and said, stop that, we don't want to hear. And that's the way it's been right from the very beginning. Go back to Genesis chapter 3 and what do you find? God gives man the most beautiful environment in which to live under God's peace and under his protective rule. But instead of praise, what does man do? Rebukes and rejects God and says, no, we'll do it our way. That's been so ever since, hasn't it? That's what Paul's speaking about in Romans chapter 1. All men everywhere. God's presence has been clearly revealed to all, he says, since the creation of the world. And so man is without excuse. But although they knew God, he says they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, mainly serving ourselves. Human beings, even faced with an unequivocal revelation of God in their own eyes and ears, would rather believe a lie. Would rather blind themselves and deafen themselves to the proclamation of his coming into their lives to offer peace and forgiveness for their arrogant, uh, arrogant and ignorant rejection of him. Isn't that astonishing? Imagine you swore at a friend and you spat in their face and had a dreadful argument with them and they went off really bruised and shocked, deeply hurt. And then some days later, that friend phoned you up and said, I'd like to meet you for a coffee. I want to tell you that I don't hold it against you what happened. I want to forgive you. I want to put it in the past and never mention it again. Will you meet me? And you meet them and they come. And what you do is you swear at them and you spit at them in the face again. And this time, for good measure, you lay them flat on the ground with a punch. That's what people do to God, you see. Here's the king offering peace and restoration publicly to those who have rebelled against them. And the response is, tell them to shut up. We don't want any more of that. No praise for God's grace. Just rebuke and rejection. Here's a people with more privileged revelation of the person and presence of God than any other people in the history of this world. Is God at fault? Is God deficient in some way in his revelation to them? No, it's man's heart, isn't it, that's defiant and deviant and dark then and now it's a salutary thought isn't it think about this 21st century Scotland has had more centuries of divine light even than first century Israel 2,000 years of Christian heritage 500 years of at least of the scriptures in our own language plenty of revelation clear and plain and public. The gospel of Jesus Christ has not been in a corner 
in the history of our land, has it? Has it? But are our eyes and ears as a people open to the king who comes in peace? Are they? I wonder where you stand with that this morning. When Jesus came to the nation of the book, he was met not with praise but rebuke. But lest any of us think, well, we're in church this morning, we're not like that, we better look down quickly, hadn't we, to verse 45 to 48. When Jesus came to the temple, the very heart of piety and devotion in Israel. Because what we find there is absolutely no different. You see verse 46, what did Jesus find? Robbery instead of prayer. A people who had destroyed the very purpose of his church. You see, even in a building, even in an institution dedicated to the glory of God, religion can so easily become twisted and perverted and corrupted, even, even when it has evangelical orthodox truth as its very foundation. That was the temple. Now, there's plenty of critics, aren't there, today of religion. But here's the thing. Jesus was a huge critic of all the religion of man, even when it had the right scriptures and the right beliefs and not the wrong ones. And that should make us think, shouldn't it? Some people think in the institution of the Christian church today that real closeness to God and the key to all of that is perfection in doctrine and practice and, and uh, polity and liturgy and training and all that sort of thing. Well, let me tell you, they had all of that in the temple. All of it. Written by God himself. But still, they had turned what was meant to be a living relationship with the living God into dead and deadly religion of man. Nothing more than self-seeking. Robbery from God, that's what Jesus called it. They turned the true revelation of God's grace into the false religion of man's greed. See, true biblical faith is all about the God who comes down from heaven to us in grace and mercy to love us and to elicit a response of love from our hearts. And that's what prayer is, isn't it? It's the response of loving hearts to God our Savior, to His grace. It's all about God's grace shaping us for His glory. That's true biblical faith. But you see, man's religion in every form is all about us reaching up to heaven, grasping for a deity who will serve our purposes. It's using God, isn't it? It's like God was the genie of Aladdin's lamp. It's not about his glory. It's all about our gain. It's not about praise and prayer to him. It's about profit for us. Not prayer, but robbery. That's what Jesus says. And in, in, in their specific case here, of course, it was starkly manifest by those who were making commercial enterprise out of the temple courts, money changers and selling things for sacrifice and so on and making a tidy profit. But you see, all through the ages... In all religions, it's always been that. Are we going to Delhi again in uh, November? I'll never forget. Often it's Diwali when uh, I'm there. I remember once uh, in a shop and the, the, the uh, Brahmin priest was coming around offering his special Diwali uh, services for people while they pulled out huge wadges of cash to give to him. These people are stinking rich out of their religion. But it's been just the same all through the history of so-called Christendom, hasn't it? Think of the massive accumulated wealth of the prince bishops uh, of the Church of Rome and so on. Think of the private jets of the prosperity gospelers today. But we need to be careful ourselves, don't we? Because having good evangelical credentials doesn't mean that we can't be corrupted in just the same way at heart. It doesn't mean that we can't turn prayer into robbery. There's so many ways that, that people can twist the grace of God into the greed of man. We can come to church really deep down to serve ourselves and our pride, not Christ and his people. And that manifests itself in so many ways, doesn't it? it might be something as simple as the tea rotor that I run, but it's my domain and I will assert my authority over it and don't you dare try and change the way we do it. Hmm? 
or the group I'm in. Well, it must be the way that I like it, because if it's not, I'll be in the huff and I'm going to go somewhere else. Or the pulpit that I preach from. It's here to serve my ambition and buff my sense of worth, not to serve Christ alone, not to bless his people, not to cherish their worth. You see, you could go on and on and on, couldn't you? Robbery instead of prayer. It's so easy with our sinful hearts to turn the living revelation of God's grace into the dead religion of man's greed. Not a grateful response of heart for his grace, but a greedy robbing of God for my gain. And you see, where the true voice of God is not being heard, where men are deaf to his proclamation, there will be no real heart response to God in prayer. And the whole purpose of God's church is then destroyed, isn't it? Instead of the temple of the living God, it becomes a place of deadness and death. Last uh, weekend, I was up in Aberdeen. I was at a reunion from a medical school graduation 25 years ago. It took us back to the halls of residence where 30, I couldn't believe, 30 years ago, I was being dropped off there uh, to go and live in Hillhead Halls, just as people were being dropped off probably next week there and no doubt in Glasgow. Nostalgia. But uh, one thing struck me with great sadness as we went around Aberdeen. So many buildings that when I was a student 30 years ago were church buildings and are no longer churches. They're silent. Some have been made into shops, some into offices, some into posh flats, and some into all sorts of other things. Why? Because they became dead, devoid of prayer, devoid of the life of God, because they refused the Word of God. And God must challenge a temple like that, as Jesus did here. And Jesus is giving them another acted prophecy before their eyes here from Malachi chapter 3. That's uh, what he's doing. In verse 46, he's actually quoting from the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 7, where the people exalted in their temple, and they thought their temple and their possession of it would make them invincible. But Jeremiah said to them from God, Think again, this temple and this land will be laid waste unless you repent and change your ways. And that's exactly what happened. They were exiled. And Jesus' arrival in the temple here echoes Malachi's words in chapter 3, where he says that the Lord whom you seek will come suddenly to your temple, but who will be able to stand when he does? Because he will come like a refiner's fire to purge, to purify, as the only hope for you if you are not to be destroyed. And when the real Jesus, you see, confronts his church like that, it becomes a fight to the very death. It can't be any other. When the real gospel, when the implications of the gospel are pressed upon any church, there is always going to be rumpus. There's always going to be division. Look at verses 47 and 48. Some were hanging on his words, yes, but others wanted to destroy him. That is the impact of the real Jesus in a church. He divides. Some will fight him to retain their status and their power and their position and their authority and their territory and their ministry. But in amongst that, there will be those who respond in faith and love and, and real prayer is reborn and real life is fanned into flame by the Spirit of God. But it's a fight to the death, always in any church, in any person's life between Christ's word and his rule and our willfulness and our rebellion. Which side are we going to be on? That's the question. Are we going to be those who hang on Jesus' words or those who want to silence and destroy him? That's an important question, isn't it? We need to keep asking that question to ourselves every time we come to church, every Sunday. Because if we claim to be Christian, the Apostle Paul tells us, doesn't he, in 1 Corinthians 6, that our body is a temple of God's Holy Spirit, where he dwells by right, where he exerts his right to rule over our lives. 
It's very easy, isn't it, on a Sunday to look splendid on the outside, just like that temple. But that temple was rotten on the inside. What's going on inside this morning? What does Jesus see that the rest of us don't see? Does he see in the temple of my life a throne room for him to reign supreme? Where his word is cherished? Where we live truly to him and for him? Or have we been robbing him of that throne? As the old hymn puts it, have I... Poor sinner, cast it all away, lived for the work and pleasure of each day, as if no Christ had shed his precious blood, as if I owed no homage to our God. Does the Lord need to come and cleanse the temple of your heart and my heart afresh and purge away some of those deadly things? Hmm? And what about our fellowship as a church? Because Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 3 again says that We together, as God's people, we are the temple of the Lord. We are his building. What does Jesus see in the building that is our church? Are people devoted to prayer? Or a den of robbers? Hmm? Are people building for him with our, our brightest and best, as Paul talks about, with gold and silver and precious stones? Or just building with wood and hay and stubble? things that cost us the least, things that really don't take much effort at all. looks fine today, but one day we'll just utterly collapse and there'll be nothing left of any value for eternity. Malachi's words and Paul's words and Jesus' own words here, they're all saying the same thing, aren't they? He comes as a cleansing fire to judge, to purify, and every temple where he seeks to dwell, must accept that cleansing, must receive the peace that comes only through that merciful purging that Jesus brings. Or or face the reality of a coming ruin that Jesus says is as terrible as it is tragic. Look at verses 41 to 44. That's what Jesus is speaking about plainly, isn't it? Do you see? It's a devastating warning of judgment. That'll mean ruin instead of peace. It speaks of a people, doesn't it? Blinded to the presence of Christ and therefore ultimately banished from the presence of Christ. The ruin that Jesus predicts here for Jerusalem recalls the words of the prophets of old predicting Israel's exile into Babylon. As I said, verse 46 quotes from Jeremiah 7 and here too in verse 43 Days will come upon you. That echoes Jeremiah's phrase, doesn't it? Days are coming when the land shall be a waste. And those words of Jesus were fulfilled just as they were in Jeremiah's day in AD 70 when the Roman invasion destroyed the city and pulled down the temple. And Jerusalem was, as Jesus says later, trampled underfoot by the Gentiles and is to this day the temple mount In Israel today has two mosques sitting on top of it. Utter ruin. And the reason Jesus clearly gives, you see in the last line of verse 44, because you did not know, you did not perceive and recognize the time of your visitation. It wasn't ignorance. It was culpable rejection of a revelation so plain and so privileged that even inanimate stones would recognize it and recognize the presence of the creator of the world. Their hearts, you see, were hard in the face of the most compelling evidence possible. The presence of God himself in the flesh, in front of them, speaking words of peace right into their very ears, wooing their hearts with patience, with great love. Some of them saw, verse 48 is clear, they were hanging on his words. But others had hearts full of hatred and would not see. Look at um, what Jesus says, just as in chapter 13, when he wooed them. Do you remember there he said, how often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not 
Look at verse 42. Would that you had perceived and grasped hold of the peace that's held out to you. But they would not. And so in the end, Jesus says they could not. Now these things are hidden from your eyes. How patient, how merciful God is. Do you remember that story about the fig tree in chapter 13? Give it more time. Give it another chance. Do everything to make it bear fruit. But in the end, there must come a time when God says, well, you've made up your mind. You see, friends, if you persistently and repeatedly say to God, leave me alone, I don't want you, stop speaking to me, leave me in peace, God will, in the end, answer your request. He will depart from you if you keep telling him to. But it won't be peace you discover, according to Jesus, but ruin. Utter ruin, everlasting ruin. They would not see, and eventually they could not see. It's the reverse of the faith of the blind man back in chapter 18. His faith saved him, and Jesus opened his eyes. But you see, unbelief and refusal to see Jesus for who he is, refusal to accept his peace, must lead in the end to a closing of your eyes and of your heart. And Jesus withdraws. That's what he's doing here. With tears, verse 41, and amid wooing words of peace, both words of Scripture from the prophets and the words of the Son of God himself in person, his wooing is real and his weeping is real. But so also is his wrath real. Can't but be real, can it? Because mercy and peace and cleansing and forgiveness has been refused and resisted and utterly rejected. And there can't be any peace for those who will not receive peace. Only ruin. Only the weeping wrath of the king who came to offer peace but was rejected because you did not know the time of your visitation, the day of the things that make for your peace. It's very salutary, isn't it? That generation of high privilege had a visitation in person. And the Son of God, remember Zechariah sung of it. God has visited his people. The day spring from on high has visited us to give forgiveness of sins and to guide our feet into the way of peace. That's what they had. Zechariah saw it and rejoiced at the coming of Jesus, as did many others. They hung on his words. But most, most of that privileged people did not. They would not see. And in the end, they could not see. And if we believe Jesus, that's why their end was not peace, but ruin. God is merciful. He is patient He's like the gardener tending that tree, wooing it, willing it to produce fruit. And that's why this world is still here. That's why this whole earth has not yet been destroyed by the folly and the wickedness of man, because God is merciful, because he's patient. So the apostle Peter says, not wishing that any should perish. And so he still comes offering peace. He comes to you. He comes to me. He's the king who offers peace. He came, said Paul, to those pagan Ephesians. He came and preached peace to you when Paul came and preached the gospel of salvation to them. And many in that place, pagan enemies, found peace, became members of his temple, members of the, the household of God. And he still comes whenever his gospel is heard. He comes today. He comes right now to us who are listening to him. Today is the day of salvation, says Paul. Today is the day of our visitation from the King of Peace. He's wooing you today in mercy and love. Don't make him weep over you. Know the time of your visitation. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't choose ruin. And he's offering you his peace. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father.
King of kings and Lord of lords and Prince of peace. Grant us, we pray, open hearts to receive your word and open hands to grasp your peace for the glory of your Son and for the grace and the mercy of his beloved cross. Amen. Amen.